Welcome to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, December 19, 2021. I am Reverend Mary Tillman, and I am your presenter for today's lesson. I apologize in advance for the raspiness of my voice due to a cold, so please bear with me. I will speak a little bit slower than normal in order for you to be able to understand me. We're still in our winter quarter study, which is Justice, Law, History. We're still in Unit 1, God Requires Justice. This is Lesson Number 3 in Unit 1. Our lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is Justice and Righteousness Reign. Faith Pathway and Bible Studies for Adults lesson title is The Source of Justice. Our devotional reading is Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. The background scripture, Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. And our printed text, Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. Our key verse is the seventh verse of the ninth chapter of Isaiah. From the NIV Bible, it reads, of the greatness of his government and peace, there shall be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And that's Isaiah 9, verse number 7 from the NIV Bible. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your holy word. Please open our understanding so that we may recognize and respect this Advent season, focusing on the significance of the coming of Christ, and then practice justice and peace in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to go into our lesson introduction, but I want you to get your pen your Sunday school book, your Bible, your notepad, and follow along as we go through this lesson. Let's get started. There are three questions for you to consider. What is the great light that is spoken of in this lesson? Question number two, what is the nature of this new day that Isaiah describes? And number three, what is the basis of hope as predicted by the prophet Isaiah? Let's take a look at the biblical context. Today's lesson is from the book of Isaiah. The purpose of the book is to call the nation of Judah back to God and to tell of God's salvation through the Messiah. The book of Isaiah contains both prose and poetry and uses personification. Also, many of the predictions foretell of a soon-to-occur event and a distant future event at the same time. The prominent figure in this lesson is the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived and preached more than 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. He was active as a prophet during the reign of five kings. The prophet Isaiah began his ministry in 740 B.C. The year King Uzziah died, Isaiah was a strong and courageous man of God. The people of God divided into two nations, the northern nation of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The work of Isaiah was confined to the southern kingdom of Judah, mostly in and around Jerusalem. Isaiah is warning the southern kingdom of Judah. The first half of the book of Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 carries the message of judgment for sin. Isaiah calls Judah, Israel, and the surrounding nations to repent of their sins. In the beginning of his ministry, Isaiah was well liked, but he soon became unpopular because his messages were difficult to hear. He called for the people to turn from their lives of sin and warned them of God's judgment and punishment. He had a some powerful messages of both judgment and of hope. The northern kingdom had sinned greatly against God, and the southern kingdom was headed in that same direction. They were perverting justice, oppressing the poor, 
turning from God to idols, and looking for military aid from heathen nations rather than turning to God. Now we're talking about the children of Israel. Isaiah's ministry began with warning the northern kingdom. During the time of Isaiah's ministry, there was widespread despair, discouragement, and dejection throughout the land of Judah. Many of the people saw no hope for a brighter and better future. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Judah was a land of social and political chaos with a weak economic climate made worse by poor, incompetent leadership. The message of Isaiah recorded in chapter 9, came as a real blessing to the people of Judah. Isaiah proclaimed that the period of gloom and anguish was over. He declared that eventually those who had lived in tyranny would experience peace and tranquility. One of the unique aspects of this message of Isaiah was his messianic pronouncements, that is, prophecies concerning the coming of Christ. Isaiah preached that God was going to send a Messiah, one anointed with the Spirit of God, who would reverse the situation of his people. Isaiah's prophecy concerning the birth of child Emmanuel is written in the context of the judgment section of this book. Isaiah promised God's intervention and future deliverance through the Messiah, the source of justice and peace. While Judah suffered the effects of the Assyrian invasion as punishment for her sins, God sent Isaiah with a message of hope and future blessings of justice and righteousness. And my brothers and sisters, as we go through changes in our society, God always has a word from, for us through our pastors and our ministers, messages of hope and future blessings for he will he will reign. He will be in charge of what happens in our lives. God has a message for you. He has a message for me. And that's why we have to keep our hope built and steadfast in him. Let us dive into this lesson. This week's lesson's aims are, as a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Number one, Analyze the importance of this prophecy for the people of God in Isaiah's time and today. Number two, celebrate the justice, righteousness, and peace that the one called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace brings to God's people. And aim number three, share with others the hope of eternal peace and justice found in Jesus' reign. There are two lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline is description of a new day, and we find that in Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 5. And the second outline is the source of permanence of a new day, Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. Let's look at outline number one, description of a new day, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 5. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Verse number three. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. In the scriptures, darkness is often used as a metaphor to describe one's spiritual condition. Likewise, light is seen as a metaphor for the presence of God or of righteousness. In verse 2, the people is a reference to the northern kingdom of Israel, which was plunged into spiritual darkness and political chaos when Israel split into two separate nations. King Jeroboam led the nation into a state of overt idolatry, and we see this in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 33. 
As the practice of Jeroboam became the norm, the nation's leaders refused to acknowledge Israel's historic relationship with God. I want to stick a pen right here and say that when we allow wrongdoings to continue over a duration of time, wrong became, becomes the norm and the people tend to forget what historically is the right thing to do. We've seen a change in our country's ruling over the insurrection of the White House back in January, January 6th to be exact, of this year. We all know it was wrong, both morally and politically, but because of one man's force feeding of bad behavior, his followers are now saying that wrong is right. The practice of idolatry is the same as the practice of Jeremiah in 1 Kings. Brothers and sisters, nothing is new under the sun. The book of Ecclesiastes speak to this very matter. This is why we must not only read, but study God's word daily so that we can rightly divide the truth. Key point number one, Jesus brings light in the midst of a world shrouded by the darkness of sin and human despair. Jesus is the light of the world. This new day was the becoming of the promised Messiah. Isaiah describes the nature of this new day. Isaiah proclaimed that God would honor his promise with Abraham to multiply his descendants and increase their joy like that of harvest time or being victorious as we read in verse number three. Verses four and five reads, For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Verse 5, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Eventually, God promised to remove the yoke of bondage and usher in a world of peace and justice. Key point number two, Jesus came to deliver all people from their slavery of sin. Note that God took the initiative. He sent the child, the Messiah, to fulfill his covenant promises of redemption and to rule in justice and righteousness. This message of hope, and it is a message of hope, was fulfilled in the birth of Christ and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. This prophecy has a dual fulfillment. It was a message of hope to the believing remnant of Isaiah's time, but also looked ahead to the first advent that we annually celebrate during this season. For believers, this should be a time of praising God for Christ's coming. The prophecy in Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 is both past and future. The prophecy anticipated a time of peace when weapons of war would no longer be needed. We see that in verse number five. Christ's coming was the actual revelation of the mercy and grace of God. We are enjoying freedom from the darkness and bondage of sin because Jesus came to us. Our freedom from sin is the evidence that he is the source of justice and righteousness. Outline number two, the source of permanence of a new day. And we find this in our lesson text, Isaiah chapter nine, verses six and seven. From the NIV Bible, it reads, verse number six, a very familiar scripture. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, verse number seven, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Key point number one. God used the prophet Isaiah to announce the coming of Christ as the Messiah. Isaiah prophesied the birth of Jesus Christ in verse number six. 
Jesus Christ is the Son of God, born in Bethlehem, fully man and fully God. Key point number two. Jesus has come to take away the sins of the world. Isaiah uses four descriptive names to explain his character, beginning with Wonderful Counselor, whose wisdom exceeds even that of Solomon and in sharp contrast to all of Israel's rulers and future rulers. We have access to the counsel of God through the scriptures, prayer, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He will be called the Mighty God. As the Mighty God, he will exercise the power of God in his rule. His power is greater than all the minds of all the people who ever lived put together. What a mighty God we serve. He is the source of our spiritual strength and power. He is the everlasting Father who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. Everlasting Father speaks of his eternal nature that identifies him as God. He promised he would never leave us or forsake us. In Matthew 28 and 20, Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Christ is the one who will establish and maintain peace for Israel and during his reign in the Millennial Kingdom. Today, as our Prince of Peace, we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and are heirs to the Kingdom. This allows us to have that perfect peace that only he can give. We read about that in Isaiah chapter 26, verse number 3. In verse number 7, Isaiah made three profound statements about the new king. One, his government shall have no end. As a descendant of King David, his reign would be continuous. Number two. The reign of the new king would be built upon a foundation of judgment and justice. And number three, God's zeal and commitment for good toward his people would ensure that these things were realized. In summary, Isaiah proclaimed that a son, the Prince of Peace, would be given. The word prince suggests that the Messiah is a ruler a leader of nations. Peace is rendered in Hebrew as shalom, denoting one of God's most precious gifts to people. Shalom is not just the absence of turmoil and confusion. It literally means completeness, soundness, welfare, prosperity, and safety. We see all of these meanings in verses 6 and 7. This prophecy of the coming Prince of Peace was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. Shalom means completeness. In Jesus Christ, every child of God is made complete. See Colossians 2, verse number 10. It reads like this from the New Living Translation. And you are complete through your union with Christ. He is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. End quote. Jesus is the very presence of God in our lives. He is the one who adds meaning to life and fills our heart with joy. He heals the brokenhearted, forgives and pardons sin, calms storms, and lifts his people from the pains of life, crowning them with the glory of his presence. Everything that's necessary for living free of the power of sin is found in Jesus. Through his death at Calvary, Jesus opened the doorway for the experience of absolute fullness of God. A second meaning of the word shalom is to prosper or prosperity. Consider 3 John chapter 1 verse number 2. And it says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. God is concerned about both our body and our souls. As Christians, we must not neglect 
or indulge ourselves, but care for our physical and spiritual needs with discipline in order to be at our best for God's service. Yes, we are required to be in good shape in order to do the work of the Lord. I hope this lesson has given us a deeper appreciation for the purpose of Jesus' coming to this earth. Only divine justice and righteousness gives everyone equal justice. The question, what would Jesus do, comes to mind every time I see a murder case in which another black person has been violently shot and killed. The laws of our land, the courts and jurors are flawed. But Jesus, the righteous judge, is on his way back, I truly believe that, and on his second coming, justice will be served. In the meantime, let us who are believers continue to trust him, wait on him, and thank him for the peace and prosperity that only he can supply. Thank you for bearing with me today with this voice of mine, and I hope that you got a thought. And let's pray that all of us have a safe and blessed holiday season and looking forward to a very healthy and prosperous new year. That's our lesson for today. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, grant that your servants may live in ways that affirm their relationship with you. Let the peace of Christ dwell richly in our hearts. Thank you for this lesson. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful and happy rest of the day.